The Nameless City When I drew nigh the Nameless City, I knew it, it was accursed. I was traveling in a parched and terrible valley under the moon, and afar I saw it protruding uncannily above the sands as part of a corpse may protrude from an ill-made grave. Fear spoke from the age-worn stones of this hoary survivor of the deluge, this great-grandmother of the eldest pyramid, and a viewless awe repelled me and bade me retreat from antique and sinister secrets that no man should see, and no man else had dared to see. Remote in the desert of Araby lies the nameless city, crumbling and inarticulate, its low walls nearly hidden by the sands of uncounted ages. It must have been thus before the first stones of Memphis were laid, and while the bricks of Babylon were yet unbaked, there is no legend so old as to give it a name, or to recall that it was ever alive. But it is told of in whispers around campfires and muttered about by grandams in the tents of sheiks, so that all the tribes shun it without wholly knowing why. It was of this place that Abdul al Hazred, the mad poet, dreamed on the night before he sang his unexplained couplet. That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. I should have known that the Arabs had good reason for shunning the nameless city, the city told of in strange tales, but seen by no living man, yet I defied them, and went into the untrodden waste with my camel. I alone have seen it, and that is why no other face bears such hideous lines of fear as mine, why no other man shivers so horribly when the night wind rattles the windows. When I came upon it, in the ghastly stillness of unending sleep, it looked at me, chilly from the rays of a cold moon amidst the desert's heat, and as I returned to its look, I forgot my triumph at finding it, and stopped still with my camel to wait for the dawn. For hours I waited, till the east grew grey and the stars faded, and the grey turned to roseal light edged with gold. I learned a moaning. I heard a moaning and saw a storm of standing stir, sand stirring among the antique stones, though the sky was clear and the vast reaches of desert still. Then suddenly above the desert's far rim came the blazing edge of the sun, seen through the tiny sandstorm which was passing away. And in my fervid state, I fancied that from some remote depth there came a crash of musical metal to hail the fiery disc as Memnon hails it from the banks of the Nile. My ears rang and my imagination seethed as I led my camel slowly across the sand to that unavocal stone place. That place too old for Egypt and Moreau to remember. That place which I alone of living men had seen. In and out amongst the shapeless foundations of houses and places I wandered, finding never a carving or inscription to tell of these men, if men they were, who built this city and dwelt therein so long ago. The antiquity of the spot was unwholesome, and I longed to encounter some kind of device to prove that the city was indeed fashioned by mankind. There were certain proportions and dimensions in the ruins which I did not like. I had with me many tools and dug much within the walls of the obliterated edifices. The progress was slow, and nothing significant was revealed. When night and the moon returned, I felt a chill wind which brought new fear, though that I did not dare to remain in the city. And as I went outside the antique walls to sleep, a small sighing sandstorm gathered behind me, blowing over the grey stones through the moon. The bright and most of the desert still. I awakened just at dawn from a pageant of horrible dreams, my ears ringing as from some metallic peal. I saw the sun peering redly through the last gas of a little sandstorm that hovered over the nameless city and marked the quietness of those of the rest of the landscape. Once more I adventured within those brooding ruins that swelled beneath the sand like an ogre under a coverlet, and again dug vainly for relics of the forgotten race. At noon I rested, and in the afternoon I spent much time tracing the walls and bygone streets and the outlines of the nearly vanished building. I saw that the city had been mighty indeed and wondered at the sources of its greatness. 
To myself I pictured all the splendors of an age so distant that Chaldea could not recall it, and thought of Sonneth the Doomed, that stood in the land of Nar when mankind was young, and of Ib, that was carven of grey stone before mankind existed. All at once I came upon a place where the bedrock rose stark through the sand and formed a low cliff, and here I saw with joy what seemed to promise further traces of the Antildilian people. Antediluvian people. Hewn rudely on the face of the cliff were the unmistakable facades of several small squat rock houses or temples, whose interiors might preserve many secrets of ages too remote for calculation, though sandstorms had long since effaced any carvings which may have been outside. Very low and sand-choked were all the dark apertures near me, but I cleared on with my spade and crawled through it, carrying a torch to reveal whatever mysteries it might hold. When I was inside, I saw that the cavern was indeed a temple, and beheld plain signs of the race that had lived and worshipped before the desert was a desert. Primitive altars, pillars, and niches, all curiously low, were not absent. And though I saw no sculptures, nor frescoes, there were many singular stones clearly shaped into symbols by artificial means. The loneliness of the chiseled chamber was very strange, for I could hardly more than kneel upright. But the area was so great that my torch shone only part of it at a time. I showed it oddly in some of the far corners, for certain altars and stones suggested forgotten rites of terrible, revolting, and inexplicable nature, and made me wonder what manner of men could have made and frequented such a temple. When I had seen all that that place contained, I crawled out again, avid to find what the temples might yield. Night had now approached, if the tangible things I had seen made curiosity stronger than fear, so that I did not flee from the long moon-cast shadows that had daunted me when I had first saw the nameless city. In the twilight I cleared another aperture and with a new torch crawled into it, finding more vague stones and symbols, though nothing more definitive than the other temple had contained. The room was just as low, but much less broad, ending in a very narrow passage crowded with obscure and cryptical shrines. About these shrines I was prying when the noise of a wind, and my camel outside broke through the stillness and drew me forth to see what I could have frightened the beast. The moon was gleaming vividly over the primeval ruins, lighting a dense cloud of sand that seemed blown by a strong but decreasing wind of some point along the cliff ahead of me. I knew it was this chilly sandy wind which had disturbed the camel and was about to lead him to a place of better shelter when I chanced to glance up and saw that there was no wind atop the cliff. This astonished me, and made me fearful again. But I immediately recalled the sudden local winds I had seen and heard at sunrise and sunset, and judged it was a normal thing. I decided that it came from some rock fissure leading to a cave, and watched the troubled sand trace its, to its source, soon perceiving that it came from the black orifice of a temple a long distance south of me, almost out of sight. Against the choking sand, cloud, I plodded toward this temple, which as I neared it loomed larger than the rest, it shooed a doorway far less clogged with and caked sand. I would have entered had not the terrific force of the icy wind almost quenched my torch. It poured madly out of the dark door, sighing uncannily as it ruffled the sand and spread among the weird ruins. Soon it grew fainter and the sand grew more and more still, till finally all was at a rest again. But a presence seemed talking among the spectral stones of the city, and when I glanced at the moon it seemed to quiver as though mirrored in unquiet waters. I was more afraid than I could explain, but not enough to dull my thirst for wonder, so as soon as the wind as was quite gone I crossed into the dark chamber from which it had come. This temple, as I had fancied from the outside, was larger than either of those I had visited before, 
and was presumably a natural cavern, since it bore winds from some beyond region. Here I could stand quite upright, but saw that the stones and altars were as low as those in the temples. On the walls and roofs I beheld for the first time some traces of the pictorial art of an ancient race. Curious, curling streaks of paint that had almost faded or crumbled away, and on two of the altars I saw with rising excitement a maze of well-fashioned, pavilionier carvings. As I held my torch aloft, it seemed to me that the shape of the roof was too regular to be natural, and I wondered what the prehistoric cutters of stone had first worked upon. Their engineering skill must have been vast. Then a brighter flare of the fantastic flame shewed me that for which I had been seeking. The opening to those remoter abysses whence the sudden wind had blown. And I grew faint when I saw that it was a small and plainly artificial door chiseled in the solid rock. I thrust my torch within. Beholding a black tunnel with the roof arcing low over a rough flight of very small, numerous, and steeply descending steps. I shall always see those steps in my dreams, for I came to learn what they meant. At the time, I hardly knew whether to call them steps or mere footholds in a precipitous descent. My mind was whirling with mad thoughts, and the words and warnings... Arab prophets seemed to float across the desert from the lands that men know to the nameless city that men dare not know. Yet I hesitated only for a moment before advancing through the portal and commencing to climb cautiously down the steep passage, feet first, as though on a ladder. It is only in the terrible phantasms of drugs or delirium that any other man can have such a descent as mine. The narrow passage led infinitely down like some hideous haunted well, and the torch I held above my head could not light the unknown depths towards which I was crawling. I lost track of the hours and forgot to consult my watch, though I was frightened when I th thought of the distance I must be traversing. There were changes of directions and of steepness, and once I came to a long, low, level passage, where I had to wriggle feet first along the rocky floor holding my torch at arm's length beyond my head. The place was not high enough for kneeling. After that, there were more of the steep steps, and I was still scrambling down intermittently when my failing torch died out. I do not think I noticed it at the time, for when I did notice it, it was still holding it high above me as if it was ablaze. I was quite unbalanced with that instinct for the strange and the unknown which had made me a wanderer upon earth and a haunter of far, ancient and forbidden places. In the darkness there flashed before my mind fragments of my cherished treasury of demonic lore. Sentences from Alhazred, the mad Arab, paragraphs from the, from the apocryphal nightmares of Damascus, and infamous lines from the delirious image du monde of Gathier de Mitz. I repeated queer extracts and muttered of Afrasrib and the daemons that floated down with him the oxes later chanting over and over again a phrase from one of Lord Dunsey's tales, the unreverent blackness of the abyss. Once, when the descent grew amazingly steep, I recited something in sing-song from Thomas More until I feared to recite more. A reservoir of darkness black, as witches cauldrons are, when filled, with moon drugs in the eclipse distilled. Learning to look if foot might pass, down throw that chasm I saw beneath, as far as vision could explore, the jetty sides as smooth as glass, looking as if vanished o'er. With that dark pitch the sea of death throws out upon its slimy shore. Time had quite ceased to exist when my feet again felt a level floor and I found myself in a place slightly higher than the rooms in the two small temples, now so incalculably far above my head. I could not quite stand, but could kneel upright, and in the dark I shuffled and crept hither and thither at random. I soon knew what I was in. I soon knew that I was in a narrow passage whose walls were lined with cases of wood having glass fronts. As in that paleozoic and abysmal place I felt... Of such things as polished wood and glass, I shuddered at the possible implications. 
The cases were apparently ranged along each side of the passage at regular intervals, and were oblong and horizontal, hideously like coffins in shape and size. When I tried to move two or three for further examination, I found that they were firmly fastened. I saw that the passage was a long one, so I floundered ahead rapidly in a creeping rung that would have seemed horrible had an eye watched me in the blackness, crossing from side to side occasionally to feel my surroundings and be sure the walls and rows of cases still stretched on. Man is so used to thinking visually that I almost forgot the darkness and pictured the endless corridor of wood and glass and its low studded monotony as though I saw it. And then in a moment of indescribable emotion, I did see it. Just when my fancy merged into real sight, I cannot tell. But there came a gradual flow ahead. And all at once I knew that I saw the dim outlines of a corridor and the cases revealed by some unknown subterranean phosphorescence. For a little while, all was exactly as I had imagined it, since the glow was very faint. But as I mechanically kept on stumbling ahead into the stronger light, I realized that my fancy had been but feeble. This hall was no relic of crudity that, like the temples in the city above, but a monument of the most magnificent and exotic art. Rich, vivid, and daringly fantastic designs and pictures formed a continuous scheme of mural paintings whose lines and colors were beyond description. The cases were of a strange golden wood with fronts of exquisite glass, and containing the mummified forms of creatures outreaching in grotesqueness the most chaotic dreams of man. To convey any idea of these monstrosities is impossible. They were of the reptile kind, with body lines suggesting sometimes a crocodile, or sometimes the seal but more often nothing of which either the naturalist or the paleontologist ever heard. In size, they approximated a small man, and their forelegs bore delicate and evidently flexible feet curiously like human hands and fingers. The strangest of all were their heads, which presented a contour violating all known biological principles. To nothing can such things be well compared. In one flash I thought of comparisons as varied as the cat, the bullfrog, the, myth the mythic satyr, and the human being. Not Jove himself had so colossal and protuberant a forehead, but the horns and the noselessness and the alligator-like jaw placed things outside all established categories. I debated for a time on the reality of the mummies, half suspecting they were artificial idols but soon decided they were indeed some Paleogene species which had lived when the nameless city was alive. To crown their grotesqueness, most of them were gorgeously enrobed in the costliest of fabrics and lavishly laden with ornaments of gold, jewels, and unknown shining metals. The importance of these crawling creatures must have been vast, for they held the first place among the wild designs on the frescoed walls and ceilings. With matchless skill had the artists drawn them in a world of their own, wherein they had cities and gardens fashioned to suit their dimensions. And I could not help but think that their pictured history was allegorical, perhaps shrewing the progress of the race that worshipped them. These creatures, I said to myself, were two men of the nameless city what the she-wolf was to Rome, or some totem beast is to a tribe of Indians. Holding this view, I could trace roughly a wonderful epic of the nameless city. A tale of a mighty seacoast metropolis that ruled the world before Africa rose out of the waves. And of its struggles as the sea shrank away and the desert crept into the fertile valley that held it. I saw its wars and triumphs, its troubles and defeats. And afterwards its terrible fight against the desert and thousands of its people, here represented an allegory by the grotesque reptiles were driven to chisel their way down through the rocks in some marvelous manner to avoid a world whereof the prophets had told them. It was all vividly weird and realistic, and its connection with the awesome descent I had made was unmistakable. I even recognized the passages. 
As I crept along the corridor towards the brighter light, I saw later stages of the painted epic. The leave taking of the race that had dwelt in the nameless city in the valley around for ten million years. The race whose souls shrank from quitting scenes their bodies had known so long where they had settled as nomads in the earth's use. Hewing in the virgin rock those primal shroom shrines at which they had never ceased to worship. Now that the light was better, I studied the pictures more closely and, remembering that the strange reptiles must represent the unknown man, pondered upon the customs of the nameless city. Many things were peculiar and inexplicable. Civilization, which included a written alphabet, had seemingly risen to a higher order than those immeasurably later civilizations of e Egypt and Caldera. Yet they were curious omissions. I could, for example, find no pictures to represent deaths or funeral customs, saves such as were related to wars, violence, and plagues, and I wondered at the reticence shown concerning natural death. It was as though an ideal of earthly immortality had been fostered as a cheering illusion. Still nearer the end of the passage was painted scenes of the utmost picturesqueness and extravagance, contrasted views of the nameless city and its desertion and growing ruin, and of the strange new realm, its paradise, to which the race had hewed its way through the stone. In these views, the city and the desert valley were shewn always by moonlight, a golden nimbus hovering over the fallen walls, and half revealing the splendid perfection of former times, shewn spectrally and elusively by the artist. The paradisal scenes were almost too extravagant to be believed, portraying a hidden world of eternal day filled with glorious cities and ethereal hills and valleys. At the very last, I thought I saw signs of an artistic anticlimax, the paintings were less skillful and much more bizarre than even the wildest of the earlier scenes. They seemed to record a slow decadence of the ancient stock, coupled with a growing ferocity toward the outside world from which it was driven away by the desert. The forms of the people, always represented by the sacred reptiles, appeared to be gradually wasting away, though their spirit as shown hovering above the ruins by moonlight gained in proportion. Emaciated priests, displayed as reptiles in ornate robes, cursed the upper air and all who breathed it. And one terrible final scene shewed a primitive-looking man, perhaps a pioneer of ancient Irem, the city of Pillars. Of ancient Aram, the city of Pillars, torn to pieces by members of the Elder Race. I remember how the Arabs fear the nameless city, and was glad that beyond this place the grey walls and ceilings were bare. As I viewed the pageant of mural history, I had approached very closely to the end of the low-sealed hall, and was aware of a great gate through which came all of the illuminating phosphorescence. Creeping up to it, I cried out loud in transcendent amazement at what lay beyond, for instead of an other and brighter chambers, there was only an illimitable void of uniform radiance. Such one might fancy when gazing down from the peak of Mount Everest, on a sea of sunlit mist. Behind me was a passage so cramped that I could not stand upright in it. Before me was an infinity of subterranean effulgence. Reaching down from the passage into the abyss was the head of a steep flight of steps. Small, numerous steps like those of black passages I had traversed, but after a few feet the glowing vapors concealed everything. One back open against the left-hand wall of the passage was a massive door of brass, incredibly thick and decorated with fantastic bass reliefs, which I could, if shut, which uh, which could, if closed, shut the whole inner world of light away from the vaults and passages of rock. I looked at the steps, and for the nonce dared not try them. I touched the open brass door and could not move it. Then I sank prone to the stone floor, my mind aflame with prejudiced reflections which not even a death-like exhaustion could banish. As I lay still with closed eyes, free to ponder, many things I had lightly noted in the frescoes came back to me with new and terrible significance. Scenes representing the name of the city in its heyday, 
the vegetation of the valley around it, and the distant lands with which its merchants traded. The allegory of the crawling creatures puzzled me by its universal prominence, and I wondered that it should be so closely followed in a pictured history of such importance. In the frescoes, a nameless city had been shrewd in proportions fitted to the reptiles. I wondered what its real proportions and magnificence had been, and reflected a moment on certain oddities I had noticed in the ruins. I thought, curiously, of the lowness of the primal temples and of the underground corridor, which were doubtless hewn, thus out of deference to the reptile deities there honored. Though it before us reduced the worshippers to crawling. Perhaps the very rites here involved crawling in imitation of the creatures. No religious theory, however, could easily explain why the level passages in that awesome descent should be as low as the temples, or lower, since one could not even kneel in it. As I thought of the crawling creatures whose hideous mummified forms were so close to me, I felt a new throb of fear. Mental associations are curious. And I shrank from the idea that except for the poor primitive man torn to pieces in the last painting, mine was the only human form amidst the many relics and symbols of the primordial life. But as always in my strange and roving existence, wonder soon drove out fear. For the luminous abyss, and what it might contain, presented a problem far, a problem worthy of the greatest explorer. But that a world that a weird world of mystery lay far down that flight of peculiarly small steps I could not doubt. And I'd hoped to find there those human memorials which the cor painted corridor had failed to give. The frescoes had pictured unbelievable cities, the valleys in this lower realm, and my fancy dwelt on the rich and colossal ruins that awaited me. My fears, indeed, concerned the past rather than the future. Not even the physical horror of my position in that stamped corridor of dead reptiles and antediluvian frescoes miles below the world I knew and faced by another world of eerie light and mist could match. The lethal dread I felt at the abysmal antiquity of the scene and its soul. An ancientness so vast that measurement is feeble seemed to leer down from the primal stones and rock-hewn temples of the nameless city. While well, the very latest of the astounding maps and the frescoes showed oceans and con continents that man has forgotten, with only here and there some vaguely familiar outlines of what could have happened to the geological ages since the painting ceased and the death-hating race resentfully succumbed to delay, no man might say. Life had seemed teemed. Life had once teemed in these caverns and in the luminous realm beyond. Now I was alone with vivid relics, and I trembled to think of the countless ages which, the, which those relics had kept a silent, deserted vigil. Suddenly there came another burst of that acute fear which had intermittently seized me ever since I first saw the terrible valley and the nameless city under a cold moon, and despite my exhaustion I found myself starting frantically to a sitting posture and gazing back along the black corridor towards a tunnel that rose out of the outer world. My sensations were much like those in which had made me shun the name of the city at night, and were as inexplicable as they were poignant. In another moment, however, I received a still greater shock in the form of a definite sound, the first which had broken the other silence in these tomb-like depths. It was a deep, low moaning, as of a distant throng of condemned spirits, and came from the direction in which I was staring. Its volume rapidly grew, till it soon reverberated rightfully through the lower passage, and at the same th time I became conscious of an increasing drought of cold air. Likewise flowing from the tunnels in the city above, the touch of this air seemed to restore my balance, for I instantly recalled the sudden gusts which had risen around the mouth of the abyss each sunset and sunrise, one of which had indeed revealed the hidden tunnels to me. I looked at my watch and saw the sunrise was near. But bracing myself to resist the gale that was sweeping down its cavern home as it had swept forth at evening, my fear again waned low, since a natural phenomenon tends to disperse to dispel broodings over the unknown. 
More and more madly poured the shrieking, moaning night wind into the gulf of the inner earth. I dropped prone again and clutched vainly at the floor for fear of being swept bodily through the open gate in the phosphorescent abyss. Such fury I had not expected, and as I grew aware of an actual slipping of my form toward the abyss I was beset by a thousand new terrors of apprehension and imagination. The malignancy of the blast awakened incredible fancies. Once more I compared myself, shudderingly, to the only human image in that frightful corridor. The man who was torn to pieces by the nameless race. For in the fiendish clawing of the swirling currents there seemed to abide a vindictive rage all the stronger because it was largely impotent. I think I screamed frantically near the last. I was almost mad. But if I did so my cries were lost in the hell-born babble of the howling wind wraiths. I tried to crawl against the murderous invisible torrent but I could not even hold my own as I was pushed slowly and inexorably toward the unknown world. Finally, reason must have wholly snapped, for I fell babbling over and over that inexplicable couplet of the mad Arab Al-Hazrad, who dreamed of the nameless city. That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. Only the grim brooding desert gods know what really took place. What indescribable struggles and scrambles in the dark I endured or what Abaddon guided me back to life. Why I must always remember and shiver in the night wind till oblivion, or worse, claims me. Monstrous, unnatural, colossal was the thing too, far beyond all the ideas of man to be believed except in the silent, damnable, small hours of the morning when one cannot sleep. I have said that the fury of the rushing blast was infernal cacamon and that its voices were hideous with the pent-up viciousness of desolate eternities. Presently these voices, while still chaotic before me, seemed to my beating brain to take articulate form behind me, and down there in the grave of unnumbered eon-dead antiquities, leagues below the dawn-lit world of men, I heard the ghastly cursing and snarling of strange touch fiends. Turning, I saw outlined against the luminous aether of the abyss what could not be seen against the dusk of the corridor. A nightmare horde of rushing devils, hate distorted, grotesquely penoplied, half transparent, devils of a race no man might mistake. The crawling reptiles of the nameless city. And as the wind died away, I was plunged into the ghoul pool darkness of earth bowels. But behind the last of the creatures, the great brazen door clanged shut with a deafening peal of metallic music whose reverberation swelled out to the distant world to hail the rising sun as Memnon hails it from the banks of the Nile. festival. I was far from home, and the spell of the eastern sea was upon me. In the twilight I heard it pounding on the rocks, and I knew it lay just over the hill where the twisting willows writhed against the clearing sky and the first stars of evening. And because my father had called me into the old town beyond, I pushed on through the shallow, new-fallen snow along the road and that soared lonely up to where Alan de Baron twinkled among the trees, on toward the very ancient town I had never seen but often dreamed of. It was the Yuletide. The men called Christmas, though they know in their hearts it is older than Bethlehem and Babylon, older than Memphis and mankind. It was the Yuletide. And I had come to last to the ancient sea town with my, where my people had dwelt and kept festival in the elder time when a festival was forbidden. Where also they held where also they had commanded their sons to keep festival once every century. That the memory of primal secrets might not be forgotten. Mine were an old people. And were old even when this land was settled three hundred years before. 
and they were strange because they had come as dark furtive folks from opiate southern gardens of orchids and spoke together spoke another tongue before they learned the tongue of the blue-eyed fishers and now they were scattered and shared only the rituals of mysteries that none living could understand I was the only one who came back that night to the old fishing town as legend bade for only the poor and lonely still remember then beyond the hill's crest I saw Kingsport outspread frostily in the gloaming snowy Kingsport with its ancient veins and steeples ridge poles and chimney pots wharves and small bridges willow trees and graveyards endless labyrinths of steep narrow crooked streets and dizzy church crowned central peak that time durst not touch ceaseless mazes of colonial houses piled and scattered at all angles and levels like a child's disordered blocks and twickety hovering on gray wings over winter whitened gabbles and gambler roofs fan lights and small paned windows one by one gleaming out in the cold dusk to join orion and the archaic stars and against the rotting waves the sea pounded a secretive immoral immemorial sea out of which the people had come in the elder time beside the road at its crest a still higher summit rose bleak and windswept and i saw that it was bearing ground where black gravestones were stuck ghoulishly through the snow like the decayed fingernails of a gigantic corpse the printless road was very lonely and sometimes i thought i heard a distant horrible creaking as of a giblet in the wind they had hanged four kinsmen of mine for witchcraft in 1692 but i did not know just where As the road wound down the seaward slope, I listened for the merry sounds of a village at evening, but did not hear them. But then I thought of the season, and I felt that these old Puritan folk might well have Christmas customs strange to me, and full of signed hearthside prayer. So after that, I did not listen for merriment or look for wayfarers, but kept on down past the hushed light farmhouses and shadowy stone walls to where the signs of ancient shops and sea taverns creaked into the salt breeze and the grotesque knockers of pillared doorways glistened along deserted, unpaved lanes in the light of little curtained windows. I had seen maps of the town and knew where to find the home of my people. It was told that I should be known and welcomed, for village legend lives long. So I hastened through Back Street to Circle Court and across the fresh snow on the one full flagstone pavement in the town, to where Green Lane leads off behind Market House. The old map still held good, and I had no trouble, though at Arkham they must have lied when they said the trolley ran past this place, since I saw not a wire overhead. No would have hit the rails in that, any case. I was glad I had chosen to walk for the white village. It seemed very beautiful from the hill, and now I was eager to knock at the door of my people, the seventh house on the left in Green Lane with an ancient peaked roof and jutting second story all built before 1650. There were lights inside the house when I came upon it and I saw from the diamond window panes that I must have been kept very close to its antique state. The upper part overhung the narrow grass-grown street and nearly met the overhanging part of the house opposite, so that I was almost in a tunnel. With the low stone doorstep wholly free from snow, there was no sidewalk but many doors, but many houses had high doors reached by double flights of steps with iron railings. It was not seen, and because I was strange to New England, I had never known its like before. Though it pleased me, I would have relished it better if there had been footprints in the snow and people in the streets, and the few windows without drawn curtains. When I sounded the archaic iron knocker, I was half afraid. Some fear had been gathering in me, perhaps because of the strangeness of my heritage and the bleakness in the evening, the queerness of the silence in that aged town of curious customs. And when my knock was answered, I was fully afraid, because I had not heard any footsteps before the door creaked open. But I was not afraid long, for the gowned, slippered old man in the doorway had a bland face that reassured me. And though he made signs that he was dumb, he wrote a quaint 
an ancient welcome with the stylus and wax tablet he carried. He beckoned me in a low, candlelit room with massive exposed rafters and dark, stiff, sparse furniture of the 17th century. The past was vivid there, for not an attribute was missing. There was a cavernous fireplace and a spinning wheel at which a bent old woman in loose wrapper and deep poke bonnet sat behind, tack back toward me. Silently spinning despite the festive season, an indefinite dampness seemed upon the place and I marveled that no fire should be blazing. The high-packed, the high-backed settle faced the row of curtained windows at the left and seemed to be occupied, though I was not sure. I did not like everything about what I saw and felt again the fear I had. This fear grew stronger from what I had before lessened it. For the more I looked at the old man's bland face, the more its very blandness terrified me. The eyes never moved, and the skin was too light wax. Finally, I was sure it was not a face at all, but a fiendishly cunning mask. But the flabby hands, curiously gloved, wrote genially on the tablet and told me I must wait a while before I could be led to the place of the festival. Pointing to a chair, table, and a pile of books, the old man now left the room. And when I suddenly sat down to read, I saw that the books were hoary and moldy, and that they included old Morister Wilde's Marvel of Science and the terrible Ceticismus Triumphatus of Joseph Glanville, published in 1681. The shocking De Monolatria of Remigus, printed in 1595 at Lyons, and worst of all, the unmensurable Necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul Alhazred, in Olias Mumius' forbidden Latin translation. A book which I had never seen, but of which I had heard monstrous things whispered. No one spoke to me, but I could hear the creaking of signs in the wind outside, and the whir of the wheel as the bonneted old woman continued her silent spinning, spinning. I thought of the room and the books and the people very morbid and disquieting. But because an old tradition of my father's had summoned me to this strange feastings, I resolved to expect queer things. So I tried to read and soon became tremendously absorbed by something I found in that accursed Necronomicon. A thought, and a legend too hideous for sanity or consciousness. But I disliked it when I fancied I heard the closings of one of the windows at the settled face as if it had been stealthily opened. It had seemed to follow a whirring that was not of the old woman's windy spinning wheel. This was not much though, for the old woman's was spinning very hard and the age clock had been striking. After I lost the feeling that they were persons on the settle and that was ready intently and shudderingly when the old man came back booted and dressed in a loose antique costume and sat down on that very bench so that I could not see him. It was certainly nervous waiting, and the blasphemous book in my hands made it doubly so. When eleven struck, however, the old man stood up, glided to a massive carved chest in a corner, and got two hooded cloaks, one of which he donned, and the other of which he draped around the old woman, who was ceasing her monotonous spinning. Then they both started out the, for the outer door, the woman lamely creeping, and the old man, after picking up the very book I had been reading, beckoning me as he drew his hood over it, that unmoving face or mask. We went out into the moonless and torturous network of that incredibly ancient town, went out as the lights of the curtain windows disappeared one by one, and the dog star leered at the throng of cowled, cloaked figures that poured silently from every doorway and formed monstrous processions up this street and that, past the creaking signs and antediluvian gables, the thatched roofs and diamond-paned windows, threading precipitous lanes, where decaying houses overlapped and crumpled together, gliding across open courts and churchyards where the lobbying lanthorns made eldritch, drunken constellations. Amid these hushed throngs I followed my voiceless guides, jostled by elbows that seemingly preternaturally soft, impressed by chests and stomachs that seemed abnormally pulpy. 
but seeing never a face and hearing never a word. Up, up, up the eerie column slithered and I saw that all the travelers were converging as they flowed near a sort of focus of crazy alleys at the top of a high hill in the center of town, where perched a great white church. I had seen it from the road's crest when I looked at Kingsport in the new dusk and it had made me shiver because Aldebaran had seemed to balance itself a moment on the ghostly spire. There was an open space around the church, partly a churchyard with spectral shafts and partly a half-paved square swept nearly bare of snow and wind, and lined with unwholesomely archaic houses having peaked roofs and overhanging gables. Death fires danced over the tombs, revealing gruesome vistas, though queerly failing to cast any shadows. Past a churchyard, where there were no houses, I could see over the hill summit and watch the glimmer of stars in the harbor through the town, though the town was invisible in the dark. Only once in a while, a lanthorn bobbed horribly through serpentine alleys on its way to overtake the throng that was now slippy, slipping speechlessly into the church. I waited till the crowd had oozed into the black doorway and till all the stragglers had followed. The old man was pulling at my sleeve, but I was determined to be the last. Then, I finally went, the sinister man and the old spinning woman before me, crossing the threshold into that swarming temple of unknown darkness. I turned once to look at the outside world as a churchyard phosphorescence cast a sickly glow on the hilltop pavement, and as I did so I shuddered. For though the wind had not left much snow, a few patches did remain on the path near the door, and in that fleeting backward look it seemed to my troubled eyes that they bore no mark of passing feet, not even mine. The church was scarce lighted by all the lanthorns that had entered it, for most of the throng had already vanished. They had streamed up the aisle between the high white pews to the trapdoor of the vault which yawned loathsomely, loathsomely open just before the pulpit, and were now squirming noiselessly in. I followed dumbly down the north foot-worn steps and into the dank, suffocating crypt. The tale of that sinuous line of night marchers seemed very horrible, and as I saw them wriggling into a venerable tomb, they seemed more horrible still. Well, then I noticed the tomb's floor had an aperture down which the throng was sliding, and in a moment we were all descending into ominous staircase of rough-hewn stone. A narrow spiral staircase damp and peculiarly odorous that wound endlessly into the bowels of the hill past monotonous walls of dripping stone blocks and crumbling mortar. It was a silent shocking descent and I observed after a horrible interval that the walls and steps were changing in nature, as if chiseled out of the solid rock. What mainly troubled me was that the myriad footfalls made no sound and set up no echoes, but after Aeons of descent I saw some side passages or burrows leading to an unknown recesses of blackness through this shaft of nighted mystery. Soon they became excessively numerous, like impious catacombs of nameless menace, and the pungent odor of decay grew quite unbearable. I knew we must have passed down though, through the mountain, and beneath the earth of Kingport itself, and I shivered that a town would be so aged and maggoty with subterraneous evil. Then I saw the lurid shimmering of pale light, and heard the insidious lapping of sunless waters. Again I shivered, for I did not like the things that the night had brought, and I wished bitterly that no forefather had summoned me to this primal rite. As the steps in the passage grew broader, I heard another sound, the thin, whining mockery of a feeble flute, and suddenly there spread out before me the boundless vista of an inner world. A vast fungus shore lit by a belching column of sick greenish flame and washed by a wide oily river that flowed from abysses frightful and unsuspected to join the blackest gulfs of immemorial ocean. Fainting and gasping, I looked at that unhallowed Eberus of titan toadstools leprous fire and slimy water and saw the cloaked throngs forming a semicircle around the blazing pillar. It was the Yule Rite, 
older than men and fated to survive him, the primal right of the solstice and of spring's promise beyond the snows, the right of fire and evergreen, light and music, and in the Stygian grotto I saw them do the right, and adore the sick pillar of flame and throw into the water handfuls gouged out by the vicious vegetation which slithered green in the chloritic lair. I saw this, and I saw something amorphously squatted away from the light, piping noisily on a flute, and as the thing piped I thought I heard noxious muffled flutterings of the fetid darkness where I could not see. But what frightened me most was that the flaming column, spouting volcanically from depths profound and inconceivable, casting no shadows as healthy flame should, and coating the nitrous stone above with a nastly venomous vetigris. For in all that seething combustion no warmth lay, but only the clamminess of death and corruption. The man who had brought me now squirmed to a point directly beside the hideous flame and made stiff ceremonial motions to the semicircle he faced. At certain stages of the rituals they did groveling obeisance, especially when he held above his head that abhorrent necronomicon had he had taken with him, and I shared all the obsessions because I had been summoned to this festival by the writings of my forefathers. Then the old man made a signal to the half-seen flute player in the darkness, which player thereupon changed its feeble drone into a scarce louder drone in another key, precipitating it as it did so a horrible, unthinkable, and unexpected. At this horror I sank nearly to the luckened earth, transfixed with a dead, with a dread, not of this world nor any world, but only with the mad spaces between the stars. Out of the unimaginable blackness beyond the gangrenous glare of that cold flame, out of the Tartarian leagues which, through which that oily river rolled uncannily, unheard, and unsuspected, there flopped rhythmically a horde of tame, trained, hybrid wings, things that no sound eye could ever wholly grasp, or sound brain ever wholly remember. They were not altogether cows, nor moles, nor buzzards, nor ants, nor vampire bats, nor decomposed human beings. But something I cannot and must not recall. They flopped limply along, half with their webbed feet and half with their membraneous wings. And as they reached the throngs of celebrants, the cow cowled figures seized and mounted them, and rode off one by one along the reaches of that unlighted river into pits and galleries of panic where poison springs feed frightful and undiscoverable cataracts. The old spinning woman had gone with the throng, and the old man remained only because I had refused when he motioned me to seize an animal and ride it like the rest. I saw when I staggered to my feet that the amorphous fruit player had rolled out of sight, but that two of the beasts were patiently standing by. As I hung back, the old man produced his stylus and tablet and wrote that he was the true deputy of my father's, who had founded the Yule worship in this ancient place, that it had been decreed I should come back, and that the most secret mysteries were yet to be performed. He wrote this in a very ancient hand, and when I still hesitated, he pulled my, he pulled from his loose robe a seal ring and a watch, both with my family arms, to prove that he was what he said. But it was hideous proof because I knew from old papers that that watch had been buried with my great-great-great-great-grandfather in 1698. Presently, the old man drew back his hood and pointed out to the family resemblance in his face, but I only shuddered because I was sure that the face was merely a devilishly waxen mask. The fluffling animals were now scratching relentlessly as the lichens, and I saw that the old man was nearly as restless himself. When one of the things began to waddle and edge away, he quickly turned to stop it, so that the suddenness of his motion dislodged the wax, waxen mask from what should have been his head. And then, because that nightmare's position barred me from the stone staircase which had been we had come, I flung myself onto the oily underground river that bubbled somewhere to the caves of the sea, flung myself into that putrescent juice of earth's inner horrors before the madness of my screams could bring down upon me all the channel legions and pest gulfs might conceal. 
At the hospital, they told me I'd been found half-frozen in Kingsport Harbor at dawn, clinging to the drifting spar that had accident sent to save me. They told me I had taken the wrong fork of the hill road that night before and fallen over the cliffs at Orange Point, a thing they deduced from prints found in the snow. There was nothing I could say because everything was wrong. Everything was wrong. With the broad window shooing a sea of roofs in which only about one in five was ancient and the sound of trolleys and motors in the streets below. They insisted that this was Kingsport and I could not deny it. When I went delirious at hearing what the hospital stood near the old churchyard on Central Hill, they sent me to St. Mary's Hospital in Arkham, where I could have better care. I liked it there, for the doctors were broad-minded and even lent me their influence in obtaining the carefully sheltered copy of al Hazrad's objectionable Necronomicon from the library of Miskatonic University. They said something about a psychosis and agreed I had better get any harassing obsessions off my mind. So I read again that hideous chapter, and shuddered doubly because it was indeed not new to me. I had seen it before, let footprints tell what they might, and where it was I had seen where it best forgotten. There was no one in waking hours who could remind me of it, but my dreams are filled with terror because of phrases I dare not quote. I dare quote only one paragraph, put into English as I can make from the awkward low Latin. The nethermost caverns are not for the fathoming of eyes that see, for their marvels are strange and terrific. Curse the ground where dead thoughts live new and oddly bodied, evil that mind that is held by no head. Wisely did Ibn Skakabau say that happy is the tomb where no wizard hath lain, and happy the town at night whose wizard are all ashes. For it is of old rumor that the soul of the devil bought hastes, not from his charnel clay, but fats and instructs the very worm that gnaws, till out of corruption horrid life springs, and the dull scavengers of life, the dull scavengers of earth wax crafty to vex it and swell monstrous to plague it. Great holes secretly are digging where earth's pores ought to suffice, and things have learnt to crawl that ought things have learnt to walk that ought to crawl. The Color of Outer Space The Color of Out of Space West of Arkham, the hills rise wild, and there are valleys with deep woods that no axe has ever cut. There are dark narrow glens where the trees slope fantastically, where the thin brooklets trickle without ever having caught the glint of sunlight. On the gentler slopes there are farms, ancient and rocky, with squat, moss-coated cottages brooding eternally over old New England, secrets in the lee of great ledges. But these are all vacant now, the wide chimneys crumbling and the shingles sighs bulging perilously beneath low gambrel roofs. The old folk have gone away, and foreigners do not like to live there. French Canadians have tried it, Italians have tried it, and the Poles have come and departed. It is not because of anything that can be seen or heard or handled, but because of something that is imagined. The place is not good for the imagination, and does not bring restful dreams at night. It must be this which keeps the foreigners away, for old Amni Pierce has never told of them anything he recalls from his strange days. Ami, whose head has been a little queer for years, is the only one who still remains, or who ever talks of strange days, and he dares to do this because his house is so near the open fields that and the travel roads around Arkham. There was once a road over the hills and through the valleys that ran straight where the blasted heath is now, 
but people ceased to use it and the new road was laid curving far toward the south. Traces of the old one can still be found amidst the weeds of the returning wilderness, and some of them will doubtless linger even when half the hollows are flooded with, for the new reservoir. When the dark woods will be cut down and blasted, heath will slumber far below blue waters whose surface will mirror the sky and ripple in the sun. And the secrets of the strange days will be one with the deep secrets, one with the hidden lore of old ocean, and of all the mystery of primal earth. When I went into the hills and vales to survey the new reservoir, they told me the place was evil. They told me this in Arkham. And because of that very old town full of witch legends, I thought the evil must be something which Grandams had whispered to children through centuries. The name Blasted Heath seemed to me very odd and theatrical, and I wondered how it had come to the folklore of a Puritan people. When I saw that dark western tangle of glens and slopes for myself and ceased to wonder at anything besides its own elder mystery, it was morning when I saw it. A shadow lurked there always there. The trees grew too thickly, and their trunks were too big for any healthy New England wood. There was too much silence in the dim alleys between them, and their floor was too soft with the dank moss and matters, and mattings of infinite years of decay. In the open spaces, mostly along the line of the old row, there were little hillside farms. Sometimes with all the buildings standing, sometimes with only one or two, and sometimes with only a lone chimney or a fast-filling cellar. Weeds and briars reigned, and furtive wild things rustled in the undergrowth. Upon everything was a haze of restlessness and oppression, a touch of the unreal and the grotesque, as if some vital element of perspective, or chiroscuro, or scuro, were awry. I did not wonder that the f I did not wonder that the foreigners would not stay, for this was no region to sleep in. It was too much like a landscape of Salvatore Rosa, too much like some forbidden woodcut in a tale of terror. But even all this was not so bad as the blasted heath. I knew the moment I came upon it at the bottom of a spacious valley, for no other name could fetch such a thing, and or any other thing fit such a name. It was as if the poet had coined the phrase from having seen this one particular region. It must, I thought, as I viewed it, be the outcome of a fire. But why had nothing new ever grown over those five acres of grey desolation that sprawled open to the sky like a great spot eaten by acid in the woods and fields. It lay largely to the north of an ancient road line, but I encroached a little on the other side. I felt an odd reluctance with about approaching, and did so at last only because my business took me through and past it. There was no vegetation of any kind on that broad expanse, but only a fine grey dust or ash which no wind seemed ever to blow about. The trees near it were sickly and stunted, and many dead tree trunks or lay, stood or lay rotting at the rim. As I walked hurriedly by, I saw the tumbled bricks, stones of an old chimney and cellar on my right, and the yawning black maw of an abandoned well, whose stagnant vapors played strange tricks with the hues of the sunlight. Even the long, dark woodland climbed beyond seemed welcome in contrast. And I marveled at more, at no more, at the frightened whispers of Arkham people. There had been no house or ruin near, even in the old days, the place must have been lonely and remote, and at twilight, dreading to repress that ominous spot, I walked circuitously back to the town by the curving road on the south. I vaguely wished some clouds would gather, for an awed timidity about the deep sky of a sky voids above had crept into my skull, so. In the evening I asked people in Arkham about the blasted heath and what was meant by that phrase strange days which so many evasively muttered. I could not however get any good answers, except that all the mystery was much more recent than I had dreamed. It was not a matter of old legendary at all, but something within the lifetime of those who spoke. 
It had happened in the 80s. The family had disappeared or was killed. Speakers would not, leave, would not be exact, and because they all told me to pay no attention to old Amami Pierce's crazy tales, I sought him out as the next morning. Having heard that he lived alone in the ancient tottering cottage where the trees first began to be get very thick, it was a fearsomely archaic place. I had begun to exude the faint miasmal odor which clings about houses that have stood too long. Only with persistent knocking could I rouse the aged man, and when he shuffled timidly to the door I could tell he was not glad to see me. He was not so feeble as I had expected. But his eyes drooped in a curious way, and his unkept clothing and white beard made him very seem very warm and dismal. Not knowing just how he could best be launched on his tales, I feigned a matter of business, told him of my surveying, and asked vague questions about the district. He was far brighter and more educated than I had been led to think, and before I knew it had grasped quite as much the subject as by any man I talked with in Arkham. He was not like other rustics I had known in the sections where reservoirs were to be. For him, there were no protests at the miles of old wood and farmland to be blotted out. Though perhaps it would have been had not his home lain outside the bounds of the future lake. Relief was all that he shewed. Relief at the doom of the dark ancient valleys through which he had roamed all his life. They were better underwater now. Better underwater since the strange days. And when his opening, his husky voice sank low, while his body leaned forward and his right forefinger began to point shakily and impressively. It was then that I heard the story, and as the rambling voice scraped and whispered on, I shivered again and again despite the summer day. Often, I had to recall the speaker from rambling. He out scientific points which he knew only by a fading parrot memory of Professor's talk, or bridge over gaps where his sense of logic and continuity broke down. When he was done, I did not wonder that his mind had snapped a trifle, or that the folk of Arkham would not speak much of the unblasted he. I hurried back before sunset to my hotel, unwilling to have the stars come out above me in the open, and the next day returned to Boston to give up my position. I could not go into the dim chaos of old forest and slope again, or face another time that grey blasted heath where the black ye well yawned deep beside the tumbled bricks and stones. The reservoir was doomed to be built now, and all those elder secrets will be safe forever under watery fathoms. But even then I do not believe I would like to visit that country by night, at least not when the sinister stars are out and nothing could bribe me to drink the new city water of Arkham. It all began, as Ami said, with the meteorite. Before that time, there had been no wild legends at all since the witch trials, and even then these western woods were not feared half so much as the small island in the Miskatonic where the devil held court besides a curious stone altar older than the Indians. These were not haunted woods, and their fantastic dusk was never terrible till the strange days. Then there had come that white noontide cloud, the string of explosions in the air, and that pillar of smoke from the valley far in the wood. And by night all Arkham had heard of the great rock that fell out of the sky and embedded itself in the ground beside the well at the Nahum Gardener place. That was the house which had stood where the blasted heath was to come. The trim, white Nahum Gardner house amidst its fertile gardens and orchids. Nahum had come to town to tell people about the stone, and had dropped in at Ami Pierce's on the way. Ami was forty then, and all the queer things were fixed very strongly in his mind. He and his wife had gone with the three professors from Miskatonic University who hastened out the next morning to see the weird visitor from unknown stellar space, and had wondered why Nahum had called it so large the day before. It had shrunk, 
Nahum said as he pointed out the big brownish mound above the ripped earth and charred crash near the archaic well swept in front of his yard, but the wise men answered that stones do not shrink. Its heat lingered persistently, and Nahum declared it had glowed faintly in the night. The professors tried it with a geologist's hammer and found it was oddly soft. It was in truth so soft as to be almost plastic, and they gouged rather than chipped a specimen to take back to the college for testing. They took it in an old pail borrowed from Nahum's kitchen, for even the small piece refused to grow cool. On the trip back, they stopped at Ami's to rest and seemed thoughtful when Mrs. Pierce remarked that the fragment was growing smaller and burning the bottom of the pail. Truly, it was not large, but perhaps they had taken less than they thought. The day after that, all of this was in the June of 82, the professors had trooped out again in a great excitement. As they passed armies, they told him what queer things the specimen had done, how it had faded wholly away when they put it in a glass beaker. The beaker had gone too, and the wise men talked about the strange stone's affinity for silicon. It had acted quite unbelievably in that well-ordered laboratory, doing nothing at all and shooting no occluded gases when heated on charcoal. Being wholly negative in the borax bead and soon proving itself absolutely non-volatile at any producible temperature including that of an oxyhydrogen blowpipe. On an anvil, it appeared highly malleable, and in the dark, its luminosity was very marked. Stubbornly refusing to grow cool, it soon had the college in a state of real excitement. And when, upon heating before the spectroscope, it displayed shining bands unlike any known colors of the normal spectrum, there was much breathless talk of new elements, bizarre optical properties, and other things which puzzled men of science are wont to say when faced by the unknown. Hot, hot as it was, they tested it in a crucible with all proper reagents. Water did nothing. Hydrochloric acid did nothing. Nitric acid did nothing, and even Aqua Regia merely hissed and splattered against its torrid invulnerability. Ami had difficulty in recalling all these things, but recognized some solvents as I mentioned them in their order usual order of use. There were ammonia and caustic soda, alcohol and ether, nauseous carbon disulfide, and a dozen others. But although the weight grew steadily less as time passed and the fragment seemed to be slightly cooling, there was no change in the solvent to shew that they had attacked the substance at all. It was a metal though, beyond a doubt. It was magnetic for one thing, and after its immersion in the acid solvents, there seemed to be a faint trace in the wood medicine figures found on meteoric iron. When the cooling had grown very considerable, the testing was carried on in glass, and it was in a glass beaker that they had left all the chips made from the original fragment during the work. The next morning, both chips and beaker were gone without a trace, and only a charred spot marked a place on the wood shelf where they had been. All this the professors told Ami as they paused at his door, and once more he went with them to see the stony messenger from the stair stars. Though this time his wife did not accompany him. They had now most certainly shrunk, and even the sober professors could not doubt the truth of what they had saw. All around the dwindling brown lump near the well was a vacant space, except where the earth had caved in. And whereas it had been a good seven feet across the day before, it was now scarcely five. It was still hot, and the sages studied its surface curiously as they detached another and larger piece with hammer and chisel. They gouged deeply this time, and as they pried away the small mass, they saw at, that the core was nothing. Look, that the core of the thing was not quite homogeneous. They had uncovered what seemed to be the side of a large colored globule embedded in the substance. The color, which resembled some of the bands in the meteor strange spectrum, was almost impossible to describe. And it was only by analogy that they call it color at all. Its texture was glossy, and upon tapping it appeared to promise both brittleness and hollowness. One of the professors gave it a smart blow with a hammer, and it burst with a nervous little pop. Nothing was emitted, and all trace of the thing vanished with the puncturing. 
It left behind a hollow spherical space of about three inches across, and all of that it probable the others would be discovered as, it, as the enclosing substance wasted away. Conjecture was vain, so after a futile attempt to find additional globules by drilling, the seekers left again. with their new specimen, which proved, however, as baffling as in the laboratory as its predecessors had been. Aside from being almost plastic, having heat, magnetism, and slight luminosity, cooling slightly in powerful acids, possessing an unknown spectrum wasting away in air, and attacking silicon compounds with mut mutual destruction as a result, it presented no identifying features whatsoever. And at the end of the tests, the college scientists were forced to own that they could not place it. It was nothing of this earth, but a piece of the great outside, and as such, dowered with outside properties and obedient to outside laws. That night there was a thunderstorm, and when the professors went out to Nahum's the next day, they met with a bitter disappointment. The stone, magnetic as it had been, must have been had some peculiar electrical property for it had drawn the lightning, as Nahum said, with its singular persistence. Six times within an hour the farmer saw the lightning strike the furrow on the front yard, and when the storm was over nothing remained but a ragged pit by the ancient well sweep, half choked with caved in earth. Digging had borne no fruit, and the scientists verified the fact of the utter vanishment. The failure was total, so that nothing was left to do but to go back to the laboratory and test again the disappearing fragment left carefully cased in lead. The fragment lasted a week, at the end of which nothing of value had been learned of it. When it had gone, no residue was left behind, and in time the professors felt scarcely sure that they had seen, indeed seen with waking eyes, that cryptid vestige of fathomless gulfs outside. That lone, weird message from other universes and other realms of matter, force, and entity. As was natural, the Arkham Papers made much of the incident with its co collegiate sponsoring. The sent and sent reporters to talk with Nahum, Gardner, and his family. At least one Boston Daily also sent a scribe, and Nahum quickly became a kind of local celebrity. He was a lean, genial person of about 50 living with his wife and three sons on the pleasant farmstead in the valley. He and Ami exchanged visits frequently, as did their wives, and Ami had nothing but praise for him after all these years. He seemed slightly proud of the, the notice his place had attracted, and talked often of the meteorite in succeeding weeks. That July and August were hot, and Nahum worked hard at his haying in the ten-acre pasture across Chapman's Brook, his rattling wane wearing deep ruts in the shadowy lanes between. The labor tired him more than it had in other years, and he felt that age was beginning to tell him on. Then fell the time of fruit and harvest. The pears and apples slowly ripened, and Nahum vowed that his orchids were prospering as never before. The fruit was growing to phenomenal size and unwanted gloss and in abundance that extra barrels were ordered to handle the future crop, but with the ripening came sore disappointment. For all of that gorgeous array of special spe species lusciousness, not one single jot was fit to eat. Into the fine flavor of the pears and apples had crept a stealthy bitterness and sickishness, so that even the smallest of bites induced a lasting disgust. It was the same with melons and tomatoes, and Ahim sadly saw that his entire crop was lost. Quick to connect events, he declared that the meteorite had poisoned the soil and thanked heaven that most of the other crops were in the upland along the road. Winter came early, and was very cold. Ami saw Nahum less often than usual and observed that he had begun to look worried. The rest of his family too seemed to have grown taciturn and were far from steady in their church-going or their attendance at the various social events on the countryside. For this reserve or melancholy, no cause could be found, though all the households confessed now and then to poor health and feeling of vague disquiet. Nahum himself 
gave the most definite statement of anyone when he said he was disturbed about a certain footprint in the snow. They were the usual winter prints of red squirrels, white rabbits, and foxes. But the brooding farmer professed to see something not quite right about their nature and arrangement. He was never specific, but appeared to think that they were not as characteristic of the anatomy and habits of squirrels and rabbits and foxes as they ought to be. Ami listened without interest to this talk until one night when he drove past Nahum's house on his sleigh on the way back from Clark's Corners. There had been a moon, and a rabbit had run across the road, and the leaps of that rabbit were longer than either Ami or his horse liked. The latter, indeed, had almost run away when brought up by a firm rain. Thereafter, Ami gave Nahum's tail more respect and wondered why the gardener dog seemed so cowed and quivering every morning. They had, added, they had, it developed, nearly lost a spirit to bark. In February, the McGregor boys from the Meadow Hill were out shooting woodchucks, and not far from the gardener place bagged a very peculiar specimen. The proportions of its body seemed slightly altered in a queer way, impossible to describe, while its face had taken on an expression which no one ever saw in a woodchuck before. The boys were genuinely frightened and threw the thing away at once so that only their grotesque tales of it ever reached the people of the countryside. But the shying of the horses near Nahum's house had now become an acknowledged thing, and all the basis for a cycle of whispered legend was fast taking form. People vowed that the snow melted faster around Nahum's than it did anywhere else, and early in March there was an odd discussion in Potter's general store at Clark's Corners. Stephen Rice had driven past gardeners in the morning and had noticed the skunk cabbages coming out through the mud by the woods across the road. Never were things of such size seen before, and they held strange colors that could not be put into any words. Their shapes were monstrous, and the horse had snorted at an odor which struck Stephen as wholly unprecedented. That afternoon, several persons drove past to see the abnormal growth, and all had agreed that plants of that kind never ought to sprout in a healthy world. The bad fruit of the fall before was freely mentioned, and it went from mouth to mouth that there was poison in Nahum's ground. Of course it was the meteorite, and remembering how strange the men from the college had found that stone to be, several farmers spoke about the matter to them. One day they paid Nahum a visit, but having no love of wild tales and folklore, were very conservative in what they inferred. The plants were certainly odd, but all skunk cabbages are more or less odd in shape and color and hue. Perhaps some mineral element from the stone had entered the soil, but it would soon be washed away. As for the footprints and frightened horses, of course this was merely country talk, which, which such a phenomenon as the aerial light would certain, be certain to start. There was really nothing for serious men to do in cases of wild gossip. The superstitious rustics will say and believe anything. And so all through the strange days the professor stayed away in contempt. Only one of them, when given two files of dust for analysis in a police job over a year and a half later, recalled that the queer color of the skunk cabbages had been very like the one of the anomalous bands of light shewn by the meteor fragment in the college spectroscope. And like the brittle gob jewel found embedded in the stone from the abyss, the samples in his analysis case gave the same odd bands at first. Though later, they lost a the property. The trees budded prematurely around Nahum's, and at night they swayed ominously in the wind. Nahum's second son Thaddeus, a lad of fifteen, swore that they swayed also when there was no wind. But even the gossips would not credit this. How, certainly, however, restlessness was in the air. The entire Gardner family developed the stealth of, habit of stealthily listening, though not for any sound which they could consciously name. The listening was indeed rather a product of moments when consciousness seemed to have to slip away. But fortunately, such moments increased week by week till it became common speech that something was wrong with all Nahum's folks. When the early saxifrage came out, it had another strange color, not quite like that of the skunk cabbage, but plainly related and equally unknown to anyone who saw it. 
Nahum took some blossoms to Arkham and showed them to the editor of the Gazette, but that dignitary did no more than write a humorous article about them, in which the dark fears of rustics were held up to polite ridicule. It was a mistake of Nahum's to tell us stolid city men about the way the great overgrown morning cloaked butterflies behaved in connection with these saxfridges. April had brought a madness to the country folk, and began that disuse of the road past the hymns which led to its ultimate abandonment. It was the vegetation. All of the orchid trees blossomed forth in strange colors, and though the stony soil of the yard and adjacent pasturage were sprang up bizarre growth which only a botanist could connect with the proper flora of the region. No sane wholesome colors were anywhere to be seen except in the green grass and leafage, but everywhere those hectic and prismatic variants of some diseased underlying primary tone without a place among the known tints of earth. The Dutchman's breaches became a thing of sinister menace, and the blood roots grew insolent at their traumatic perversion. Army and the gardeners thought that most of the colors had a sort of haunting familiarity and decided that they reminded one of the brittle gobule in the meteor. The hoon plowed and saw the ten acre pasture and the upland lot, but did nothing with the land around the house. He knew it would be of no use and hoped that the summer's strange growths would all draw all the poison from the soil. He was prepared for almost anything now and had grown used to the sense of something near waiting, near him waiting to be heard. The shunning of his house by neighbors told on him, of course, but it was his wife more. The boys were better off being at school each day, but they could not help being frightened by the gossip. Thaddeus, an especially sensitive youth, suffered the most. In May, the insects came, and the home's place became a nightmare of buzzing and crawling. Most of the creatures seemed not quite usual in their aspect and motions, and their nocturnal habits contradicted all former experience. The gardeners took to watching at night, watching in all directions at random for something. They could not tell what. It was then they had all they all It was then that they all owned that Thaddeus had been right about the trees. Mr. Gardner was the next to see it from the window as she watched the swollen bows of a maple against a moonlit sky. The bows surely moved, and there was no wind. It must be the sap. Strangeness had come in to everything growing now. Yet it was none of Nahum's family at all who made the next discovery. Familiarity had dulled them. What they could not see was glimpsed by a timid windmill salesman from Bolton who drove by one night in ignorance in the country legends. What he told in Arkham was given a short paragraph in the Gazette, and it was there that all farmers, Nahum included, saw it first. The night had been dark and the buggy lamps faint, but around a farm in the valley which everyone knew from the account must be Nahum's, the darkness had been less thick. A dim, though distinct, luminosity seemed to inhere in all the vegetation, grass, leaves, and blossoms alike, while at one moment a detached piece of the phosphorescence appeared to stir fervently in the yard near the barn. The grass had so far seemed untouched, and the cows were freely pastured in the lot near the house. But toward the end of May, the milk began to be bad, and the whom had the cows driven to the uplands, after which the trouble ceased. Not long after this, the change in grass and leaves became apparent to the eye. All the vidu was going grey, and it was developing a highly singular quality of brittleness. Ami, who was now the only person who ever visited the place, and his visits were becoming fewer and fewer. When school closed, the gardeners were virtually cut off from the world and sometimes let Ami do the errands for them in town. They were failing both, they were failing curiously both physically and mentally, and no one was surprised when the news of Miss Gardner's madness stole around. It happened in June, when the anniversary of the meteor's fall and the poor woman screamed about things in the air which she could not describe. It was her ravings that there was not a single specific noun, but only verbs and pronouns. Things moved and changed and fluttered, and ears tingled to impulses which were not holy sounds. Something was taken away. 
she was being drained of something. Something was fastening itself on her that ought to not to be. Someone must make it keep off. Nothing was ever still in the night. The walls and windows shifted. Nahum did not send her to the country as a county asylum. Let her wander about the house as long as she was harmless to herself and others. Even when her expression changed, he did nothing. But when the boys grew afraid of her and Thaddeus nearly fainted at the way she made faces at him, he decided to keep her locked in the attic. By July, she had ceased to speak and crawled on all fours. Before that month was over, Nahum got the mad notion that she was slightly luminous in the dark. As he now clearly saw, this was the case with the nearby vegetation. It was a little before this that the horses had stampeded. Something had aroused them in the night, and their neighing and kicking in their stalls had been horrible. There seemed virtually nothing to do to calm them, and when the hoon opened the stable door, they all bolted out like frightened woodland deer. It took a week to track down all four, and when found, they were seemed to be quite useless and unmanageable. Something had snapped in their brains, and each one had to be shot for its own good. Nahum borrowed a horse from Ami for his haying, but found it would not approach the barn. It shied, balked, and whinnied, and in the end he could do nothing but drive it into the yard while the men used their own strength to get the heavy wagon near enough to hayloft for convenient pitching. And all the while the vegetation was turning gray and brittle. Even the flowers whose hues had been so strange were graying now, and the fruit was coming out gray and, and dwarfed and tasteless. The asters at Goldenrod bloomed gray and distorted, and the roses and zinnians of, and hollyhocks in the front yard were such blasphemous looking things that Nahud's oldest boy, Zenus, cut them down. Strangely puffed insects died about that time, even the bees that had left their hives and taken to the woods. By September, all the vegetation was fast crumbling to a grayish powder, and Nahum feared that the trees would die before the poison was out of the soil. His wife now had spells of terrific screaming, and he and the boys were in constant state of nervous tension. They shunned people now, and when school opened, the boys did not go. But it was Ami on one of his fair visits who first realized that the well water was no longer good. It had an evil taste that was not exactly f fetid nor exactly salty, and Ami advised his friend to dig another well on higher ground used till the soil was good again. Nahum, however, ignored the warning, for he had by that time become callous to strange and unpleasant things. He and the boys continued to use the tainted supply, drinking it as listlessly and mechanically as they ate their meager and ill-cooked meals and did their thankless and monotonous chores throughout the aimless days. There was something of stolen resignations about them all, as if they walked in another, as if they walked half in another world between the minds of nameless guards to a certain and familiar doom. Thaddeus went mad. In September, after a visit to the well, he had gone with a pail and come back empty handed shrinking and waving his arms and sometimes lapsing into an inane titter or a whisper about the moving colors down there. Two in one family was pretty bad, but Nahum was very brave about it. He let the boy run for about a week until he began stumbling and hurting himself and then he shut him in the attic room across the hall from his mother's. The way they screamed at each other from behind their locked doors was very terrible especially to little Merwin, who fancied they talked in some terrible languages that was not of Earth. Merwin was getting frightfully imaginative, and his restlessness was worse after the shutting away of the brother who had been his greatest playmate. Almost at the same time, the mortality among the livestock commenced. Poultry turned grayish and died very quickly, their meat being found dry and noisome upon cutting. Hogs grew inordinably fat, then suddenly began to undergo loathsome changes which no one could explain. The meat was of course useless, and Nahum was at his wit's end. No rural veterinary would approach his place, and the city veterinary from Arkham was openly baffled. 
The swine began growing grey and brittle and falling to pieces before they died and their eyes and muzzles developed singular alterations. It was very inexplicable, for they had never been fed from the tainted vegetation. Then something struck the cows. Certain areas, or sometimes the whole body, would be uncannily shriveled or compressed, and atrocious collapses or disintegrations were common. In the last stages, and death was always the result, it would be a graying and turning brittle like that which beset the hogs. There could be no question of poison, for all the cases occurred in a locked and undisturbed barn. No bites of prowling things could have brought the virus, for what live beast of earth can pass through solid obstacles? It must be only natural disease. Yet what disease could reach such results was beyond any mind guessing. When the harvest came, there was not an animal surviving on the place. For the stock and poultry were dead and the dogs had run away. These dogs, three in number, had all vanished one night and were never heard of again. The five cats had left some time before, but their going was scarcely noticed since there now seemed to be no mice. And only Mrs. Gardner had made pets of the graceful felines. On the 19th of October, Nahum staggered into Ami's house with hideous news. The death had come to poor Thaddeus in his attic room, and it had come in a way he couldn't, which could not be told. Nahum had dug a grave in the railed family plot behind the farm, and had put therein what he found. There could have been nothing from outside, for the small barred window and locked door were intact, but it was much as if it had been in the barn. Ami and his wife consoled the stricken man as best they could, but shuddered as they did so. Stark terror seemed to cling around the gardeners and all they touched, and the very presence of one of the house was the breath from regions unnamed and unnameable. Ami accompanied Nahum home with the greatest reluctance, and did what he might to calm the hysterical sobbing of little Merwin. Zenas needed no calming, he had come of late to do nothing but stare into space and obey what his father told him. And Ami thought that his fate was very merciful. Now and then, Merman's scream were answered faintly from the attic in the response to an inquiring look. Nahim said that his wife was getting very feeble. When night approached, Ami managed to get away, for not even friendship could make him stay in that spot when the faint glow of the vegetation began and the trees may or may not have swayed without wind. It was really lucky for Ami that he did not, that he was not more imaginative. As things were, his mind was bent ever so slightly. But had he been able to connect and reflect upon all the portents around him, he must inevitably have turned a total maniac. In the twilight, he hastened home, the screams of the madwoman and the nervous child ringing horribly in his ears. Three days later, Nahum lurched into Ami's kitchen in the early morning, and in the absence of his host, stammered out a desperate tale once more. While Mrs. Pierce listened in clutching fright, it was little Merwin this time. He was gone. He had gone out late at night with a lantern and pail for water, and he'd never come back. He had been going to pieces for days and hardly knew what he was about. Screamed at everything, there had been a frantic shriek from the yard then, but before the father could get to the door, the boy was gone. There was no glow from the lantern he had taken, and and of the child himself no trace. At the time Nahum thought the lantern and pail were gone too, but when dawn came and the man had plodded back from his all-night search of the woods and fields, he had found some very curious things near the well. And there was a crushed and apparently somewhat melted mass of iron which had certainly been the lantern, while a bent bale and twisted iron hoops beside it, both half-fused, seemed to hint at the remnants of the pail. That was all. Nahum was past imagining. Mrs. Pierce was blank. An omni. When he had reached home and heard the tale, could give no guess. Merwin was gone, and there would be no use in telling the people around who all shunned gardeners now. No use either in telling the city people at Arkham who laughed at everything. Bad was gone, and now Merwin was gone. Something was creeping and creeping and waiting to be seen and felt and heard. Nahum would go soon, and he wanted 
Ami to look after his wife and Zenus if they survived him. It must all be a judgment of some sort, though. He could not fancy what for, since he had always walked uprightly in the Lord's way, so as far as he knew. For over two weeks, Ami saw nothing of Nahum, and then worried about what might have happened. He overcame his fears and paid the gardener's place a visit. There was no smoke from the great chimney, and for a moment the visitor was apprehensive of the worst. The aspect of the whole farm was shocking, grayish withered grass and leaves on the ground, vines falling in brittle wreckage from archaic walls and gabbles, and great bare trees clawing up the gray November sky with a study malevolence which Omni could not but feel had come from more subtle change in the tilt of the branches. But Nahum was alive after all. He was weak and lying on a couch in the low-sealed kitchen, but perfectly conscious and able to give simple orders to Zenas. The room was deadly cold, and as Ami visibly shivered, the host shouted huskily to Zenas for more wood. Wood, indeed, was sorely needed, since the cavernous fireplace was unlit and empty, with the clout of soot blowing about in the chill wind that came down the chimney. Presently, Nahum asked him if the extra wood had made him any more comfortable, and then Ami saw what had happened. The stoutest cord had broken at last, and the hapless father's mind was proof against more sorrow. Questioning tactfully, Ami could no, get no clear data at all about the missing Zenas. In the well, he lives in the well, was all the clouded father would say. Then there flashed across the visitor's mind as suddenly thought of the mad wife, and he changed his line of inquiry. Nabi, why is she here? Why, here she is! Was the surprised response of poor Nahum, and Ami soon saw that he must search for himself, leaving the hapless babbler on the couch. He took the keys from their nail beside the door and climbed the creaking stairs to the attic. It was very close and noisome up there, and... No sound could be heard from any direction. Of the four doors in sight, only one was locked, and on this he tried various keys on the ring he had taken. The third key proved the right one, and after some fumbling on me, he threw open the door. It was quite dark inside, for the window was small and half obscured by crude wooden bars, and Ami could see nothing at all on the wide planked floor. The stench was beyond enduring, and before proceeding further, he had to retreat to another room and return with his lungs filled with breathable air. When he did enter, he saw something in dark in the corner, and upon seeing him more clearly, he screamed outright. While he screamed, he thought a momentary cloud eclipsed the window, and a second later, he felt himself brushed as if by some hateful current of vapor. Strange colors danced before his eyes, and had not a present horror numbled him, he would have thought of the globule and the meteor that the theolog geologist hammered and shattered, and of the morbid vegetation that had sprouted in the spring, as if, as it was, he thought only of the blasphemous monstrosity which confronted him, and which all too clearly had shared the nameless fate of young Thaddeus and the livestock, but the terrible thing about this horror was that it was very slowly and perceptibly moved as it continued to crumble. Ami would give no added particulars to this scene, but the shape in the corner does not reappear in this tale as a moving object. There are things which cannot be mentioned, and what is done in common humanity is sometimes cruelly judged by the law. I gather that no moving thing was left in the attic room, and that to leave anything capable of motion there would have been a deed so monstrous as to damn any accountable being to eternal torment. Anything but a stolid farmer could would have fainted or gone mad, but Ami walked conscious through that lower doorway and locked a, a cursed secret behind him. There would be Nahum to deal with now. He must be fed and tended, and removed to some place where he could be cared for. Commencing his descent of the dark stairs, Ami heard a thud below him. He even thought a scream had been suddenly choked off, and called nervously the clammy vapor which had brushed by him in that frightful room above. What presence had his cry and entry started up? Halted by some vague fear, he heard still further sounds below. Indubitably, there was some sort of heavy dragging, and a most detestably sticky noise as some 
as of some fiendish and unclean species of suction with an associative sense goaded to fervorous heights he the thought unaccountably of what he had seen upstairs good god what eldritch dream world was this in which he had blundered he dared move neither back nor forward but stood there trembling at the black curve in the box and staircase Every trifle of the scene burnt itself into his brain. The sounds, the sense of dread expectancy, the darkness, the steepness of the narrow steps, and merciful heaven. The faint but unmistakable luminosity of all the woodwork in sight, steps, sides, exposed lathes, and beams alike. Then there burst forth a frantic whinny from Ami's horse outside, followed at once by a clatter which told of a frenzied runaway. In another moment, the horse and buggy had gone beyond earshot, leaving the frightened man on the dark stairs to guess what had sent them. But that was not all. There had been another sound out there. A sort of liquid splash. Water. It must have been the well. He had left Hero untied near it. And a bucky wheel must have brushed the coping and knocked in the stone, and still the pale phosphorescence glowed in the detestably ancient woodwork. God, how old the house was. Most of it built before 1670, and the gambrel roof not later than 1730. A feeble scratching on the floor downstairs now sounded distinctly. An army's grip tightened on a heavy stick he had picked up in the attic for some reason. Slowly nerving himself, he finished his descent and walked boldly toward the kitchen. But he did not complete the walk, because what he sought was no longer there. It had come to meet him, and it was still alive after a fashion. Whether it had crawled or whether it had been dragged by an external force, Ami could not say, but the dead had been at it. Everything had happened at, in the last half hour, but collapse graying and disintegration were almost far advanced. There was a horrible brittleness and dry fragments were scaling off. Ami could not touch it, but looked horror horrifiedly into the distorted parody that had been a face. What was it, Nahum? What was it? He whispered, and the cleft, bulging lifts were just able to crack out a final answer. Nothing. Nothing. The color, it burns, cold and wet, but it burns, it lived in the well, I'd seen it, a kind of smoke, just like the flowers last spring, the well shone at night, bad and moony and zenith, everything alive, sucking the life out of everything, in that stone, it must have come in that stone, within the whole place. Don't know what it was. That round thing them men from the college dug out in the stone. They smashed it. It was the same color. Just the same like the flowers and plants. Must have been more of them. Seeds. Seeds they growed. I seen it the first time this week. Must have got strong on Zenus. He was a big boy. Full of life. It beats down your mind and then gets you. Burns you up in the well water. He was right about that evil water. Zenith never came back from the well. Can't get away. Draws ye. Ye know something's that coming. But ain't no use. I seen it in agent sanctain that's took was took. Where's Nobby, homie? My head's no good. Don't know how long since I fed her. It'll give her a whiff if we ain't careful. Just a color. Her face is getting to have that sometimes color towards night. That burns and sucks. It comes from some place where things aren't as they is here. Some of them professors said so. He was right. Look out on me. It'll do something more. Sucks the life out. But that was all. That which spoke could speak no more, because it had completely caved in. 
Mommy laid a red checkered tablecloth over what was left and reeled out the back door into the fields. He climbed the slope to the ten-acre pasture and stumbled home by the north roads and the woods. He would not pass that well from which his horse had run away. He had looked at it through the window and had seen that no stone was missing from the rim. When the lurching budgie had not dislodged anything at all, the splash had been something else. Something which went into the well after it had, it had done with poor Nahim. When Ami reached the house, the horse and buggy arrived before him and thrown his wife into fits of anxiety. Reassuring her without explanations, he set out at once for Arkham and notified the authorities that the Gardner family was no more. He indulged in no details, but merely told the deaths of Nahum's and Nabi that that of Thaddeus uh, being already known, and mentioned that the cause seemed to be the strange ailment which had killed the livestock. He also stated that Merwin and Zenith had disappeared. There was considerable questioning at the police station, and in the end, Ami was compelled to take the three officers to the gardener home. Together with the coroner, the medical examiner, and the veterinary who had treated the diseased animals. He went much against his will, but the afternoon was advancing and he feared the fall of night over that accursed place. But it was some comfort to have so many people with him. The six men drove out in a Democrat wagon, following Ami's buggy, and arrived at the pest ridden farmhouse at about four o'clock. Used as the officers were to gruesome experiences, not one remained unmoved at what was found in the attic and under the red checked tablecloth of the floor below. The whole aspect of the farm with its grey desolation was terrible enough, but those two crumbling objects were beyond all bounds. No one could look long at them, and even the medical examiner admitted that there was very little to examine. Specimens could be analyzed, of course, so he busied himself in attaining them. And here it develops, there was a very puzzling aftermath that occurred at the college laboratory where the two files of dust were finally taken. Under the spectroscope were samples that gave off an unknown spectrum, in which many of the baffling bands were previously like those which the strange meteor had yielded in the previous year. The property of emitting this spectrum vanished in a month, the dust thereafter consisting mainly of alkaline phosphates and carbonates. Ami would have not told the men about the well if he had thought they meant anything, meant to do anything then and there. He was getting toward sunset and he was anxious to be away, but he could not help glancing nervously at the stony curve by the street sweep, or by the great sweep, and when a detective questioned him, he admitted that Nahum had feared something down there, so much so that he never thought of searching it for Merwin and Zenas. After that, nothing would do but that they empty and explore the well immediately, so Ami had to wait trembling while pail after pail of rank water was hauled up and splashed onto the soaking ground outside. The men sniffed in disgust at the fluid, and toward the last held their noses against a feta they were uncovering. It was not so long a job as they had feared it would be since the water was phenomenally low. There was no need to speak exactly of what they found. Merwin and Zenas were both, in part, thought to be vestiges or mainly skeletal. There was also a small deer and large dog in about the same state and a number of bones of smaller animals. The ooze and slime at the bottom seemed inexplicably porous and bubbling, and a man who descended on the handholds with a long pole found that he could sink the wooden shaft to any depth in the mud of the floor without meeting any solid obstruction. Twilight had now fallen, and lanterns were brought from the house. Then when it was seen that nothing further could be gained from the well, everything, everyone went indoors and conferred in the ancient sitting room while the intermittent light of a spectral half-moon played wanly on the grey desolation outside. The men were frankly nonplussed by the entire case and could no, find no convincing common element to link the strange vegetable conditions, the unknown disease of livestock and humans, and the unaccountable deaths of Merwin and Zenith in a tainted well. They had heard the common country talk, it is true, but could not believe that anything contrary to natural law had occurred. No doubt the meteor had poisoned the soil, but the illness of persons and animals who had eaten nothing grown in that soil was another matter. Was it the well water? 
Very possibly. It might be a good idea to analyze it, but what peculiar madness would have made both boys jump into the well? The deeds were so similar and the fragments shrewd that they had both suffered from the grey brittle death. Why was everything so grey and brittle? It was the coroner seated near a window overlooking the yard who first noticed the glow about the well. Night had fully set in and all the abhorrent ground seemed faintly luminous with more than the fistful moonbeams. But this new glow was something definite and dis distinct and appeared to shoot up from the black pit like a softened ray from a searchlight, giving dull reflections in the little ground pools where the water had been emptied. It had a very queer color, and as all the men clustered around the window, Ami gave a violent start. But this strange beam of ghastly miasma was to him of no unfamiliar hue. He had seen that color before and feared to think what it might mean. He had seen it in a nasty little globule in the air like two summers ago, had seen it in the crazy vegetation of the springtime, and had thought he had seen it for an instant that very morning against a small barred window of that terrible attic room where nameless things had happened. It had flashed there a second, and clammy and hateful current of vapor had brushed past him, and then poor Nahum had been taken by something of that color. He had said so at the last, said it was the globule and the plants. After that had come the runaway in the yard and the splash in the well, and now that the well was belching forth to the night a pale insidious beam of the same demonic tint. It does credit to the alertness of Ami's mind that he puzzled even at the tense moment over a point that was essentially scientific. He could not but wonder in his gleaming of the same impression from the vapor glimpsed in the daytime against a window opening on the morning sky and from a nocturnal exhalation seen as a phosphorescent mist against a black and blasted landscape. It wasn't right. It was against nature. And he thought those terrible last words of his stricken friend. It comes from some place where there are things as things ain't as there is here. One of them professors said so. All three horses outside tied to a pair of shriveling saplings by the road were now neighing and pawning frantically. The dragon, the wagon driver, started for the door to do something, but Ami laid a shakily hand on his shoulder. Don't go out there. There's more to this nor what we know. Ahum said something lived in the well that sucks your life out. He said it must be something that growed up from the round ball like ones we all seen in the media stone that fell a year ago in June. Sucks and burns, he said. And it's just a cloud of color like that light out there now. That you can hardly see and get into what it is. Nahum thought it feeds on everything living as he gets stronger all the time. He said he's seen it this last week. Must be getting something... From a way off in the sky like the men from the college said last year the meteor stone was. The way it's made and the way it works ain't no like no God's world. It's some met from beyond. So the men paused indecisively as the light from the well grew stronger and the hitched horses pawed and whinnied in increasing frenzy. It was truly an awful moment, with terror in that ancient and accursed house itself, four monstrous sets of fragments, two from the house and two from the well, in the woodshed behind, and that shaft of unknown and unholy iridescence from the slimy depths in front. Ami had restrained the driver on impulse, forgetting how uninjured he himself was after that clammy brushing of that colored vapor in the attic room. But perhaps... It was just as well that he acted as he did. No one will ever know what was abroad that night, and though the blasphemy from beyond had not so far hurt any human of unweakened mind, there is no telling what it might have, n what might not have done at the last moment. And with its seemingly increased strength and the special signs of purpose, it was soon to display beneath the half-clouded moonlit sky. All at once, one of the detectives at the window gave a short, sharp gasp. The others looked at him, and then quickly followed his own gaze upward at, to the point at which its idle straying had been suddenly arrested. 
There was no need for words. What had been disputed in country gossip was disputable no longer. And it is because of the thing which every man of that party agreed in whispering later on that the strange days are never talked about in Arkham. It is necessary to premise that there, were th there was no wind at the hour of the evening. Not one. One did arise not long afterward, but there was absolutely none then. Even the dry tips of the lingering hedge mustard, grey and blighted and the fringe of the roof of the standing Democrat wagon were unstirred. And yet amid that tense, godless calm, the high bar bars of all the trees in the yard were moving. They were twitching morbidly and spasmodically, clawing and convulsive and epileptic madness in the moonlit clouds, scratching impotently in the noxious air as if jerked by some alien and bodiless line of linkage, with subterranean horrors writhing and struggling below the black roots. Not a man breathed for several seconds. Then a cloud of darker depth passed over the moon and the silhouette of clutching branches faded out momentarily. At this there was a general cry, muffled with all but husky and almost identical from every throat. But the terror had not faded with the silhouette and in a fearsome instant of deeper darkness the watchers saw wriggling at the treetop height a thousand tiny points of faint and unhallowed radiance tipping each bow like the fire of St. Elmo or the flames that came down on the apostles' heads at Pentecost. It was a monstrous constellation of unnatural light, like a gutted swarm of corpse-fed fireflies dancing hellish sarabands over an accursed marsh, and its color was the same nameless intrusion which Ami had to come to recognize and dread. All the while, the shaft of phosphorescence from the wall well was getting brighter and brighter bringing to the minds of the huddled men a sense of doom and abnormality which far outraced any image in their conscious minds could form. It was no longer shining out, it was pouring out, and as the shapeless stream of unplaceable color left the, left the well it seemed to flow directly into the sky. The veterinary shivered and walked to the front door to drop the extra, heavy extra bar across it. Ami shook no less and had to tug and wait for a lack of controllable voice when he wished to draw notice to the growing luminosity of the trees. The neighing and stamping of the horses had become utterly frightful, but not a soul of that group in the old house would have ventured forth for an earthly reward. With the moments the shining of the trees increased while their restless branches seemed to strange more and more toward verticality. The wood of the well sweeped the shining, was shining now, and presently a policeman dumbly pointed at some wooden sheds and beehives near the stone wall on the, on the west. They were commencing to shine too, though the tether vehicles of the visitors seemed so far unaffected. Then there was a wild commotion and clopping in the road, and as Ami quenched the lamp for better seeing, they realized that a span of frantic greys had broke their sapling and run off with a democrat wagon. The shock served to loosen several tongues and embarrassed whispers who were exchanged. It spreads on everything organic that's been around here, muttered the medical examiner. No one replied, but the man who had been in the well gave a hint that his long pole must have stirred up something intangible. It was awful, he added. There was no bottom at all, just ooze and bubbles and the feeling of something lurking under there. Ami's horse still pawed and screamed definitely in the road outside, and nearly drowned, its owner's faint qu uh, quaver as he mumbled its formless reflections. It's come from that stone. It growed down there. It got everything living. It fed itself on them, mind and body. I had a Miri, Zenis, and Nabi. Nahum was the last. They all drunk the water. Got strong on them. It come from beyond, where things ain't like they be here, and now it's going home. At this point the column of unknown colour flared suddenly stronger and began to weave itself into fantastic suggestions of shape which each spectator later described differently. 
It came from poor tethered heroes such a sound as no man before or since has ever heard from a horse. Every person in that low-pitched sitting room stopped his ears, and Ami turned away from the window in horror and nausea. Words could not convey it. When Ami looked out again at the hapless beast lay huddled, inert in the moonlit ground between the splintered shafts of the buggy, that was the last of Hero till they buried him the next day. But the present was no time to mourn, for almost at this instant the detective silently called attention to something terrible in the very room with them. In the absence of the lamplight, it was clear that a faint phosphorescence had begun to pervade the entire apartment. It glowed on the broad planked floor and the fragment of rag carpet. It shimmered across the sashes of the small paned windows. It ran up and down the exposed corner post. Coruscated about the shelf and mantel and infected the very doors and furniture. And each minute saw it strengthen and at last, it was very plain that healthy living things must leave that house. Let me shrewd them the back door and the path through the fields to the ten acre pasture. They walked and stumbled as in a dream and did not dare look back till they were far away on the high ground. They were glad of the path, or they could not have gone the front way by that well. It was bad enough passing the glowing barn and sheds and those shining orchid trees with their gnarled, fiendish contours, but thank heaven the branches did their worst, twisting high up. The moon went under some very black clouds as they crossed a rustic bridge over Chapman's Brook and was blindly groping them from there to the open meadows. When they looked back towards the valley and the distant gardener place at the bottom, they saw a fearsome sight. All the farm was shining with the hideous unknown blend of colors, trees, buildings, and even such grass and herbage as had not been the wholly changed to lethal gray brittleness. The bows were all straining skyward, tipped with tongues of foul flame and lambian tricklings of the same monstrous fire were creeping out creeping about the ridge poles of the house, barn, and sheds. It was a vision from a it was a scene from a vision of Fasuli. And over the rest reigned that riot of luminous amorphousness. That alien and undimensioned rainbow of cryptic poison from the well. Seething, feeling, lapping, reaching, scintillating, straining, and malignant bubbling in its cosmic and unrecognizable chromaticism. Then, without warning, the hideous thing shot vertically up towards the sky like a rocket or meteor, leaving behind no trail and disappearing through a round and curiously regular hole in the clouds before any man could gasp or cry out. No watcher can ever forget that sight, and Ami stared blankly at the stars of Cygnus and Deneb, twinkling above the others, where the unknown color had melted into the Milky Way. But his gaze was the the next moment called swiftly to the earth by the crackling in the valley. It was just that. Only a wooden ripling, only a wooden ripping and cackling and not an explosion, as so many others of the party vowed. Yet the outcome was the same, for in one feverish kaleidoscopic instant there burst up from that doomed and accursed farm a gleamingly eruptive cataclysm of unnatural sparks and substance. Blurring the glance of the few who saw it and sending forth to the zenith a bombarding cloud dust, cloud burst of such colored and fantastic fragments as our universe must need to sown. Through quickly reclosing vapors, they followed the great morbidity that had vanished, and in another second they had vanished too. Behind and below was only a darkness to which the men dared not return, and all about was a mounting wind which seemed to sweep down in black. For gusts from interstellar space it shrieked and howled and lashed the fields and distorted woods in a mad cosmic frenzy, till soon the trembling party realized it would be of no use waiting for the moon to shoe what was left down there at the homes. Too odd even to hint theories, the seven shaking men trudged back towards Arkham by the north road. Ami was worse than his fellows, and begged them to see him inside his own kitchen. 
instead of keeping straight onto town. He did not wish to cross the nighted, wind-whipped woods alone to his home on the main road, for he had an adverse, for he had an added shock that the others were spared, and was crushed forever with a brooding fear he dared not even mention for many years to come. As the rest of the watchers on that temptuous hill had stolidly set their faces towards the road, Ami had looked back an instant at the shadowed valley of desolation so lately sheltering his ill-starred friend, and from that stricken, faraway spot he had seen something feasibly rise, only to sink down again upon this place from which the great shapeless horror had shot into the sky. It was just a color, but not any color of our earth or heavens. And because Ami recognized that color, he knew that this last faint remnant must still lurk down there in the well. He has never been quite right since. Ami would never go near the place again. It is over half a century now since the horror happened, but he has never been there, and will be glad when the new reservoir blots it out. It's, I shall be glad too, for I do not like the way the sunlight changed color around the mouth of that abandoned well I passed. I hope the water will always be very deep, but even so, I shall never drink it. I do not think I shall visit Arkham County hereafter. Three of the men who had been with Ami returned the next morning to see the ruins by daylight, but there were not any real ruins. Only the bricks of the chimney and stones of the cellar, some mineral and metallic litter here and there, and the rim of that nefandous well. Save for Ami's dead horse, which they towed away and buried, the buggy which they shortly returned to him, everything that had been living had gone. Five eldritch acres of dusty grey desert remained. Nor has anything ever grown there since. To this day, it sprawls open to the sky like a great spot eaten by acid in the woods and fields. And the sky, who have ever dared glimpse it in spite of the rural tales, have famed it, have named it the Blasted Heath. The rural tales are queer. They might even be queer if city men and college chemists could be interested enough to analyze the water from that disused well or the grey dust that no wind seems ever to disperse. Botanists, too, ought to study the stunted flora on the border of that spot, for they might shed light on the country notion that the blight is spreading. Little by little, perhaps an inch a year. People say the colour of the neighbouring herbage is not quite right in the spring, and that wild things leave queer prints in the light winter snow. Snow never seems quite so heavy on that blasted heath as it is anywhere elsewhere, Horses, the few that are f left in this motor age, grow skittish in that silent valley, and hunters cannot depend on their dogs too near the splotch of grayish dust. They say the mental influences are very bad too. Numbers went queer in the years after Nahum's taking. And always they lacked the power to get away. When the strong-minded folk all left the region, and only the foreigners tried to live in the crumbling old homesteads, they could not stay, though. And one sometimes wondered what sight beyond ours their wild, weird stores of whispered magic had given them. Their dreams at night, they protest, are very horrible in their grotesque country, and surely the very look of the dark realm is enough to stir a morbid fancy. No traveller has ever escaped a sense of strangeness in those deep ravines. The artists shiver as they paint thick woods whose mystery is as much as the spirit as the eye. I myself am curious about the sensation I derived from my one lone walk before Ami told me his tale. When twilight came, I vaguely wished some clouds would gather, for an odd timidity about the deep sky voids above have crept into my soul. Don't ask me for my opinion. I do not know. That is all. There was no one but Ami to question, for Arkham people will not talk about these strange days. And all three professors who saw the air light and its colors, globule, are dead. There were other globules, depend upon that. One must have fed itself and escaped, and probably down there was an another which was too late. No doubt, it is still down the well. I know there was something wrong with the sunlight I saw above the miasmal brink. The rustics say the light creeps an inch a year. So perhaps there's kind of growth or nourishment even now 
But whatever demon hatchling is there, it must be tethered to something, or else it would quickly spread. Is it fastened to the roots of those trees and that claw the air? One of the current Arkham tales is that about fat oaks that shine and move as they ought to not to at night. What is it? Only God knows. In terms of matter, I suppose the thing Omni described would be called a gas. But this gas obeyed laws that are not of our cosmos. This was no fruit of such worlds and suns as shine on the telescopes and photographic plates of our observatories. This was no breath from the skies whose motions and dimensions our astronomers measures or deem too vast to measure. It was just a color out of space. A frightful messenger from unformed realms, an infinity beyond all nature as we know it. From realms whose mere existence stuns the brains and numbs us with the black extra cosmic gulfs it throws open before our frenzied eyes. I doubt very much if Ami consciously lied to me. I do not think his tale was, at, was all a freak of madness as the town folk had forewarned. Something terrible came to the hills and valleys on that meteor, and something terrible, though I know not in what proportion, still remains. I shall be glad to see the water come. Meanwhile, I hope nothing will happen to Ami. He saw so much of the thing, and its influence was so insidious. Why has he never been able to move away? How clearly he recalled those dying words of Nathum's. I can't get away. Draw she... Ye know no, you know something is that coming? I can't know, but I ain't no use. Ami is such a good old man, when the reservoir gang gets to work, I must write the chief engineer to keep a sharp watch on him. I would hate to think of him as the grey, twisted, brittle monstrosity which persists more and more in troubling my sleep.